Welcome to this episode of The Adapted Lens. I'm your host, Jason Giralo. Hi, I'm Gordon Lang from Camelabs.com. I'm just kidding. That's funny. I love you, Gordon. So on this episode of The Adapted Lens, we're going to talk about long lens alternatives, equivalents, and the big lie. First, let me be clear, full frame does have its advantages. If I were a wedding photographer full time, or if I were only shooting nights, I definitely would think a full frame camera would be the best option. However, that's not how most of us shoot these days. Is it how you shoot? Next, most of us watching this YouTube video right now aren't full time photographers. Full time photographers don't spend a whole lot of time watching YouTube and worrying about sensor size. Let's face it. If you're listening to this vlog right now, chances are you're a hobbyist, enthusiast, or you side hustle as a photographer. First off, do you really think Annie Leibovitz owns that phase one body? I don't think so. I think she rents it when she has a job that she needs that kind of sensor for. And yet, camera companies have convinced all of us that if we don't own a full frame or sometimes even medium format camera, we're just not going to be great photographers. And I think that is just wrong. So by now if you've seen some of my other videos you know that this is my primary wildlife lens. It's the Canon 500 f 4.5 L lens. It's a few years old now and by a few I mean it's probably older than most of you watching this right now. It's a great camera lens. It's sharp. It's fast. It lets in a lot of light with that big front aperture. But the problem is it's pretty heavy. Most of the time when I go out shooting I'm carrying this camera along with a gimbal head on a carbon fiber tripod just to take the weight off because to handhold this all day does get tiring. Is the wind really following me all day? This is the third time I've recorded this video. It even gets tiring just holding it for a few minutes while I'm making this video. So it is back in my van. Now that's not to say that that camera lens doesn't have some major advantages. If I'm shooting at dawn or dusk or under a large tree canopy, that bright aperture yeah, that's awesome. And on a full frame camera, it's really hard to beat for light gathering. But that's not when I mostly shoot. Most of the time I'm shooting are in conditions like this. I'm a weekend warrior, probably like most of us, meaning that I don't get to shoot when conditions are the best. I get to shoot when I don't have to work. So let's talk about some alternatives. This is the 100-400 f4.5 5.6 LIS 2. It's the twisty, not the pushy pulley, uh, zoom lens from Canon. It is super sharp. I love this lens. It is awesome. It's also about $2,000, making it a heck of a lot less expensive than that 500. The problem, it's only 400, so you're losing some focal length. On a full frame sensor, you're at 400 millimeters at the longest end. But you can add teleconverters, and we'll get to that. But what are some other alternatives besides these kind of lenses? This is a super zoom. Watch it zoom. Ooh. This crazy little camera is like 750 millimeters when it's fully zoomed in. It is a Canon 740 SX 740 HS. I bought this camera primarily for when I go to Disney. If I'm going out with my family and I'm taking a walk and I don't plan on really taking a big camera. This is a really great option as a walk around camera for a variety of different photography options. You can shoot wide, you can shoot tight, this does great time lapses, it shoots 4K video. It's this thick. It's crazy. The battery actually comes with a real battery charger. This is a really great option and I highly recommend it as a walk around, do everything kind of camera. It's not really a 7 or 800 millimeter lens of course. If you read the front in very very gray light type, it says 4.3 to 172 
millimeters. So this is 172 millimeter actual focal length, but when you multiply it by the crop factor of a really, really tiny cell phone sized sensor in here, you're getting some crazy reach. And yeah, there's some major trade-offs. Would I shoot this in really low light? No. Would I take this out if I was gonna try and make a giant wall print? No. But if you use it within its limitations, you can absolutely make excellent photographs with this tiny little camera. But to top it all, it's like 400 bucks. I often use that little camera to shoot B-roll for this channel and to do things like time lapses because it's just so light and portable. It's easy to just stick into a bag and forget about it until you need it. I love cameras like that that make it easy. Now that's not to say that that form factor is your only option. They make cameras that are DSLR sized that are considered super zoom or bridge cameras. Nikon makes ones with two and three thousand times zoom. I'm not saying that this is a good option to replace a giant 500 millimeter f4 lens, but what it is a good option to replace, if you're a birder who takes a spotting scope, binoculars, and a camera into the field, that camera can replace your spotting scope, and you can take images through it as well as look at birds from far away. It's really a dual option setup that I think is a really good option for birders who also like to take pictures. Is it going to replace my 500 f4? No. Is it going to replace a full frame sensor? No. That's why it's important to remember that they don't just make one camera that does everything for everybody, but camera manufacturers make lots of cameras because everybody has different needs. My next option, a spotting scope. This is an angled spotting scope. It's really great when you have a lot of people looking because you don't have to adjust the height on a tripod up and down. But they do make straight spotting scopes, which are much better for this purpose. But you can actually buy an adapter. It goes right on your smartphone and it attaches your smartphone to your scope. You can take great images and video using your smartphone, which you always have with you, and a spotting scope. The adapter is like 60 bucks, and if you already have a spotting scope and you're not looking to make wall size prints, that's a really great option. Plus, this is very light, it's much more affordable. It's weather sealed, so if you're out in the storm, you don't have to worry about this getting messed up. It's nitrogen purged, so it never fogs up. It can fall into the mud and fall into a river, and this lives on my car. It takes tons of abuse, and it, it still looks pretty good considering the fact that it's always with me. It doesn't weigh anything, and I've taken some really great images and video using it. Again, does this replace a 500 f4 and a full frame camera? No. But it certainly can be used for someone who has casual photography ambitions to take really great images that they can be proud of, share online, and even make some small or medium sized prints with. Keep in mind with a spotting scope setup, the bigger and better the spotting scope, the better your images are going to turn out. So that's probably a $600 spotting scope, at least when I bought it new, although I probably wouldn't pay $600 for it now. Um, if you spend more than that, or if you have a very high-end spotting scope, your images are going to get progressively better. Also, there's no autofocus with that setup. It's kind of unfortunate that there's no spotting scopes that have autofocus. So you are forced to dial it in manually with the little focusing ring on the top, or some of them have a more traditional camera-style focusing ring. And then tap on the screen on your smartphone to pull fine focus. So it's not ideal for things like birds in flight. But if you're photographing a duck or say a wading bird that's kind of far away, that's a really great option. Plus, if you have a high magnification scope, you can get way longer than you can with a camera lens. I've seen photos with spotting scopes taken with smartphones of birds that are so far away I could barely tell that they were there with the naked eye. If you want to take the concept of photography with a spotting scope even further, companies like Koa and Swarovski make dedicated adapters where you can put an SLR or even a mirrorless camera directly into a spotting scope and have even better results with more natural feeling focus because you're looking directly through the camera as opposed to using an adapter. It feels just like a lens mounted, but you're saving a ton of weight, you're saving a ton of money. Even a very expensive Swarovski spotting scope is just a couple of thousand dollars compared to spending ten, twelve, or even eighteen thousand dollars on a large Nikon or Canon or even now Sony lens. I think that's a great option for folks who want to kind of straddle the line between birding and photography because remember you just take that camera off and put the eyepiece on and now you have an excellent spotting scope as well. I'm just going to talk for a minute about a couple of other options out there that I've thought of that might be good replacements for long expensive lenses for you, although they haven't worked necessarily for me. First up, 
a mirror lens, also known as a catodioptric lens. These are basically like little mini telescopes. If you think about the Hubble telescope, it doesn't use a giant piece of glass. It uses two mirrors that focus and magnify light. These are essentially like little telescopes that you bolt onto the front of your lens. There are, of course, some major downsides though. First off, autofocus. I think only Minolta has made an autofocus version of a catodioptric lens. Other than that, everything you're gonna buy on the market right now is a manually focusing lens. Now they are built for manual focus, so the throw is a nice long throw to make it easier to manually focus, but still, it's tough when you're talking about a very shallow depth of field at a very long focal length. Second, these lenses of course don't have stabilization, so if you're shooting with a camera that does, great. If you have a camera that has in-body image stabilization, it might still be a great option for you to carry around a small, lightweight wildlife lens. Another downside though, the bokeh is really strange. If you've ever seen bokeh from a mirror lens, it's got like a donut shaped quality in the background. It can be very distracting. Now you can fix some of that in Photoshop if you want to take the time to do that, but just be aware it does have a weird bokeh. And lastly, and I think this is really a killer, it doesn't have the ability to change aperture. So you're always in shutter priority. You can change your shutter speed on your camera. Of course you can change the ISO, but the aperture is fixed at either F5.6 or F8. Generally that means that you can't control your depth of field. Now I prefer to shoot an aperture priority about 95% of the time. And so that for me means I'm always stuck at a single aperture. Another option that's only available to Nikon shooters is phase Fresnel technology. I really wish that other camera manufacturers would implement this kind of technology. See, a Fresnel lens is essentially a lens with the outside cut out. If you've ever been to a lighthouse, you see these giant round lenses in concentric circles. Essentially, that's what a phase Fresnel lens is. It's a Fresnel type lens. Being a Fresnel lens, it means you're cutting out all that extra weight versus a traditional lens. It means you can make the lens smaller and lighter than a traditional lens. So Nikon has used this technology in two lenses, the 300 f4 PF and the 500 f5.6 PF. Both of these lenses are made for full frame cameras and both of them are leading edge in terms of sharpness and size compared to their counterparts. The 300 f4 PF is essentially the size of a 24 to 70 f2.8 and weighs even less. And the 500 f5.6 PF is about the size of a 70 to 200 and weighs less. These are huge advantages for Nikon shooters. And if you're a Nikon shooter today, I'd say keep whatever camera you have and go buy one of those two lenses. A couple of challenges, of course, the 500 f5.6 is really hard to get here in the United States. The rumor is they're making about a thousand a month of these lenses. I don't know why, but Nikon is just not able to keep up with demand with these lenses. The other challenge, of course, if you're not a Nikon shooter, you're out of luck. Canon does make the 400 DO and DO2. They're similar technology. Canon use some non-traditional elements as opposed to glass to hopefully cut down on the size and weight and price of the lenses. Now they got the first two right. It is a smaller and lighter lens, but they didn't get the third part right. They're very expensive. Buying a 400 DO right now is around a $6,000 lens, and that's certainly gonna put you in the same price category as most other super telephoto lenses out there today. It's getting windy again. I literally have the camera inside my minivan so that it doesn't get as much wind as possible. It's kind of a weird setup, but whatever does the job. So my last option, and the one I think that hits the sweet spot as far as price, size, weight, and sharpness, is this. This is the Panasonic Leica 100 to 400 millimeter lens and the Panasonic G9. This combination has simply blown me away. It's fun to shoot with. It's a nice full size camera body, so the grip is nice. The lens is nice and sharp. It's weather sealed. It's so small, I don't even need to use the tripod foot. It's just a great setup to carry around all day. It gets me incredible results. It's nice and sharp. The autofocus is fantastic. I think Micro Four Thirds might be the perfect combination of size and ability in camera lenses today. But Micro Four Thirds, you say, it's such a small sensor. It's four times smaller than full frame. It's a quarter of the size as full frame. It doesn't have any of the light gathering ability of full frame. Let's talk a little bit about equivalence and why you might be surprised at the results. Once again, this is my venerable 100 to 400 millimeter L Mark II that Canon makes. It's an awesome,
it is simply an incredible lens. Bolted onto my full frame EOS R, it's really hard to beat the results. 30 something megapixels and this camera lens. The problem is, 400 millimeters is kind of short for wildlife. So what do I do? I bolt on the 2 times teleconverter. This is the Mark III version of the 2x teleconverter from Canon. It is the sharpest 2 times teleconverter that Canon makes. And on my EOS R, it does work pretty well. Yeah, you take a hit on sharpness. Yeah, you take a hit on focusing speed. But the thing that people don't remember is that when you add a 5.6 and a 2x teleconverter, it gets you to 800 millimeters, right? But it's 800 millimeters at f11. Now, if you shoot a DSLR, your, your DSLR is not going to autofocus at f11. It just won't. If you use a mirrorless camera, like my EOS R, it will autofocus at f11. Albeit, it will be slower. The thing about it is, that 100 to 400 Panasonic Leica, it's a third of a stop slower than this setup on my full frame camera when I use the 2 times teleconverter. To put it simply, this is f11, that's f13. Now I know that sounds like a big gap, but that's only a third of a stop difference. If you were to think of it in full frame terms, this is an f5.6 and that's an f6.3. Really not a big difference. So what do you lose by giving up a third of a stop? Really not a whole lot. To be honest, at those long telephoto lengths, depth of field is super thin anyway. In fact, so much so that on a full frame camera, I'm usually having to stop down anyway, just to get the whole subject in focus. I don't want a duck with its eye in focus and the rest of it out of focus. That's silliness. Maybe that's fine for a model, but it's certainly not what I want for wildlife photography. Yeah, I want a background blur, I want to separate the subject from the background, but you can do this a lot more effectively just simply by getting down to the subject's eye level. Instead of shooting on a tripod and pointing down at your subject, just get down low. That effectively moves the background further away and solves your problem of background blur with a smaller sensor. Let's keep talking a little bit about equivalence. Again, my 100 to 400, this time with the 1.4 teleconverter. Now I have an APS-C camera, my EOS M6 Mark II. It's a great camera. I think it's fantastic. It's the camera I typically record my vlog on. When I bolted onto this bear, it's just a little over 600, it's like 640 millimeters at f8, which is fine, plenty sharp. 600 millimeters, 640 millimeters is a nice long focal length for shooting wildlife. But the problem is, this is a big lens. It's a lens made for full frame. And so when you put this on a small APS-C camera, you're wasting a ton of that light. You're wasting a ton of the lens sharpness. Although you won't get the corners that are not as good as you would see on full frame on an APS-C because it's cropping out the corners, you do lose some of the resolution. This lens was made for full frame, which means larger pixels. So I won't put the 2x teleconverter on this lens because it does take too much of a sharpness hit and too much of an autofocusing hit. But I would put the 1.4 teleconverter on here. And I think that's how probably a lot of wildlife photographers shoot. They have an APS-C camera body, say the 7D Mark II, and they put the 100 to 400 millimeter on either bare or with the 1.4 teleconverter. Both of those options are fine. So this 100 to 400 millimeter lens with the 1.4 teleconverter on an APS-C body, say a 7D Mark II, or even my little EOS M6 Mark II with the 1.6 crop factor of a Canon or a 1.5 crop factor of a Nikon, turns it into essentially the same lens as this on a full frame camera with a two times teleconverter, which is only a third of a stop faster than this. Now tell me, which one do you think is more comfortable to hike in the field with all day? Now I'm certainly not here to espouse the wonders of Micro Four Thirds, but I think it's plain irresponsible for vloggers and bloggers and folks on the internet to talk about the death of Micro Four Thirds and the fact that Micro Four Thirds is going away as a system when they're completely ignoring the full story. Folks like me who don't have good backs, this is a great system. Folks like me who don't want to hike with 7, 10, 12 pounds, this is a great system. Folks like most of us who are only ever showing their images on the internet, things like Instagram and Facebook, it doesn't matter if you're shooting full frame. No one's going to see the difference. Maybe you don't want to carry all the weight. Maybe you just can't carry all the weight. I think it's irresponsible for folks to go on about the death of a camera system like Micro Four Thirds without truly discussing the entire story. The reality is, for most of us, most of the time, Micro Four Thirds is a great system. And the bigger reality is that most of the time, you won't even know the difference between a full frame sensor and a Micro Four Thirds sensor because of equivalence. 
All right, let's say you're a portrait photographer. I'm sure many of you like to take portraits, and you're hired to do a group portrait, say, for Christmas. There's 15 people at this portrait, so you're gonna assign, line them up in a couple of rows. Well, you're not gonna shoot that portrait at f1.4, are you? Of course not, because only one person would be focused. Everybody else would be in the bokeh, so to speak. It would be silly to take the picture at 1.4. So your only options are focus stack. Now that's kind of ridiculous because people move in between shots or stop down. How far would you stop down? My guess at a standard focal length, say with a 24 to 105 that I'm recording this vlog on right now, probably f8, maybe even f11 depending on the situation, how far you are from the subject. At f8, you would have a certain amount of depth of field and that would correlate to an ISO and a shutter speed, right? It's pretty simple stuff. On a full frame sensor, on a full frame camera, with a full frame lens. If you were to say, put that same exact setup with the same number of people on the same situation in a micro four thirds camera, since it is two stops slower, you wouldn't be shooting that camera at F8, right? You wouldn't need to stop down to F8 to gain all that depth of field. You'd be shooting that camera at F4, two stops slower. Meaning you'd be at two stops slower ISO or two stops faster shutter speed. Depending on the situation, one or the other might be advantageous. The reality is, at the end of the day, an F4 and an F8, depending on the sensor size, completely indistinguishable from the other. The background burr would be the same. If you needed to, the shutter speed would be the same. And therefore, the ISO would be two stops lower than it would be on full frame on Micro Four Thirds. To me, this simply answers the question if you can get great results using a Micro Four Thirds camera. And maybe you're the kind of photographer that likes just the eyelash in focus. Maybe you like to shoot everything at f1.2 or f1.4. That's fine. If that's you, get a full frame camera by all means. But to me, I like my viewers to see more than an eyeball in focus when I take a picture. For that, typically I'm shooting at f2.8 and if I'm in the studio with strobes, maybe even a higher f-stop like f5.6 or f8 anyway. And therefore, full frame completely loses its advantage. You can shoot at f5.6 on a full frame camera. You can shoot at f5.6 on a micro four thirds camera. Either way, if you're trying to get more in focus, micro four thirds does have the advantage. Yeah, you could stop down. I've heard people say, oh, well you can stop down in a full frame camera. Yeah, but you lose the light. It loses its advantage. Stop down two stops to equal micro four thirds and you're raising the ISOs two stops. There's your advantage gone. Let's do a quick review. A 300 f4, say the 300 f4 from Olympus. Put that on a micro four thirds camera. You're at 600 millimeters, right? Well, the experts on YouTube say, oh, it's a 600 millimeter f8, right? Okay, fine. So go out to the store, buy a 300 f4 for Canon on a full frame camera. Bolt on a two times teleconverter, it gets you to 600 millimeters, and put it on a full frame camera. Guess what? You're still at f8. That's the big lie. Like I said, you won't always be at the same shutter speed for a given aperture. Yes, full frame has its advantages. I can't suddenly take a piece of equipment off of my 100 to 400 Panasonic and suddenly make it a true 500 millimeter F4 lens. I can't do it. Yes, you have that advantage. But for 99% of us, 99% of the time, micro four thirds is enough. But bigger than that, bigger than that whole conversation, I think it's time as a photography community that we expect more from reviewers. Yes, full frame has its advantages, but so does APS-C, so does micro four thirds, and one inch, and medium format, and large format, and iPhones. This being said, what I want you to take away from this video, if you're an iPhone shooter, great. Go make great images with your iPhone. If you're an Android shooter, why are you shooting Android? No, I'm just kidding. If you're an Android shooter, great. Go shoot Android, make great images. If you shoot micro four thirds or one inch or APS-C or APS-H or full frame or six four five or six by seven or six by nine or six by 17 or four by five or eight by 10 or some other crazy format that I'm not aware of, go make great images. Quit worrying about the thing that's behind your lens and worry about the thing that's behind your camera instead. So as we wrap up 2019, let's focus more on making great images and focus less on the piece of silicon that's in your camera. 
Let's focus more on telling great stories and less on equivalence and focal length and f-stop and which camera company is doing better than what and how Sony is dominating the industry and who's paying who for what review. It's all just noise. And coming from a YouTuber, that means watch less video. Go make more. Go produce more. Go create more. Put down the TV and go outside and make great images. And as we wrap up this video, I want to remind you all to be thankful that we live in a time of abundance. That we can have debates about sensor size and focal length equivalence. If anything, these times have shown us that we have an embarrassment of riches as photographers. And we should all be very thankful that we live in this time. And with that, I'm going to say, bye for now.